Do you guys want to start just kind of where you're from? Or? Uh, uh, like geographically? Yeah. Sorry. Like your role or your student or Sure, 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 sure. Like okay. Just a, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so we met. I'm uh, Lucia Turpak. I'm program manager in Piper, and I've been here for about two weeks. Okay. Uh, my name is Ray Allingham. I work at the Barbara Davis Center. Um, I actually do the depression screening for our patients in the pediatrics department. I'm Sarah. I also work at the Barbara Davis Center. I'm the quality improvement manager there, and we're looking at expanding the depression screen program and, you know, suicide part of it. So, yeah. Carolyn Giuseppe, faculty in epidemiology. And I'm Sarah Brandspiegel. I'm with uh, the Piper program and also um, with the Systems for Action program uh, in the Health Systems Management and Policy Department. I'm Lisa Miller. I'm also a faculty in epidemiology and the program director for the Preventive Medicine Residency. And we have a total of six residents. They all rotate through the VA their first year. They spend eight months there, so they, they have a lot of VA exposure. Um, we also have a HRSA grant, and one of the focus areas of that HRSA grant is, is mental health. So I feel like this is really nice. relevant yeah. for me Wonderful. in our resident space. I'm Katie, I work at the Barbara Davis Center as well, and I work um, strictly with our high-risk patient population, which get a lot of depression screenings mm -hmm. and suicide uh, interventions. I'm Jennifer Box, I work for our Press Program at the Institute for Health Research. Uh, I do mental health and implementation research, mm -hmm. and we're currently in the process of doing a research study alongside the implementation of zero suicide, so oh, cool. mm -hmm. okay. it seems very relevant for us. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll do a quick introduction and then I can let you take off. Okay. So I'm Emmy Bass. I'm the emergency medicine do a lot of suicide related research, and I'm the deputy director for Piper, which is hosting the seminar series uh, program for injury prevention, education, and research. Great, super. And um, I'm glad you could all make it. Um, Piper is really interested in how we build collaborations across campuses, across schools, across disciplines, and looking at all things injury related. So that's why we were thrilled to get. Uh, Nazi Barini from the um, VA, just that way for anyone who doesn't know, <laughs> on campus now. She's the director of education for the Rocky Mountain uh, Mental Illness Research Education and Clinical Center, or MIRA, um, which is one of several national hubs really uh, doing all things mental illness related, including suicide prevention. Does a lot of work locally and nationally it's related to suicide prevention. Thank you. Thank you. So I guess, I guess I'll just stay seated as long as this can change. Yeah. Um, so it's an absolute pleasure to be here today and present on this, I don't know how many years in the making this program um, has been just from sort of inception to um, design and implementation, doing something like population-based suicide risk screening in the VA health system enterprise-wide, just moving it outside of mental health is not um, an easy task, but it has been Probably one of the most exciting opportunities that I've had uh, the pleasure of being a part of um, since I've been working in the VA over sort of 10 years. Um, and I think just speaking about collaboration, such a great opportunity to collaborate with um, a lot of different disciplines and a lot of um, professionals sort of uh, across the VA and sort of to make this, um, to roll out something at sort of at this scale. Um, so I really um, am <clears throat> particularly excited because we presented kind of on facets of this um, sort of a couple of times, but this is the first time that I'm presenting sort of on the development, implementation, and some data. <laughs> um, and even more exciting sort of how we use sort of that data to actually make some refinements um, to implementation. So I think um, it's particularly really cool to be able to, to present the sort of the, the wide range of, of things related to this. Um, this is just a disclaimer. Um, this work is supported by the Department of Veterans Affairs, but it does not represent the views of the VA or the federal government. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just again, going back to, I mean, it really uh, takes a village to do this kind of work. And we've had such an amazing um, team of uh, leaders across the VA and collaborators that have been sort of involved um, really, really involved in, in making this happen from the get-go. Um, 
the MIREC is sort of kind of the implementation hub in terms of leading impl implementation, but we've had uh, folks from primary care, emergency medicine, um, performance measurement group, the, uh, the program office have been really involved in sort of seeing this vision through um, and really helping with the day-to-day -day, um, sort of work that it takes to implement something like this. Um, so just want to acknowledge um, all my great uh, team members and collaborators. Um, I'm going to be referring to this quite a bit throughout um, the presentation. Um, I, I think it's rare that, I think this is the ideal, right? This sort of cycle of sort of research informing practice and policy and this can sort of continuous cycle. Um, I don't know like that we ever sort of see it somewhat seamlessly happen in, in practice and in real life. Um, I think this uh, kind of what we're doing here with suicide risk screening and evaluation really does sort of mimic this cycle and I'm going to be really going through and sort of talking about that uh, throughout the presentation. Um, so just in terms of a little background, there's a, a growing amount of evidence that shows that people who die by suicide aren't really seeking mental health care at the time um, of their death. Uh, so this is really um, quite interesting and in fact they are often seen in the ED, primary care, or other medical settings um, at the time of their death or right prior, prior to their death. So this really prompted um, sort of a sent sentinel alert report by the, by the Joint Commission really s sort of highlighting um, the fact that if we really stick to sort of screening and evaluating mental health um, settings, we're going to be missing a lot of people um, who are at risk. Uh, so really calling to sort of look at suicide screening sort of more um, universally and population-wide. Um, at the time, or shortly after, we were also in the process of updating the VA DOD clinical practice guideline for suicide. Um, and in the 2013 version, um, there was no specific recommendations for screening uh, for suicide across settings. Um, and there wasn't really any specific guidelines around sort of components of sort of what a, a really good um, assessment or evaluation should consist of. But in the 2019 version, we have five recommendations specifically covering screening and evaluation. Um, so basically what this sort of amounts to is a growing body of evidence um, that's really kind of identifying sort of the importance of, of screening, um, again, across um, <coughs> mental health and medical settings, but also kind of giving you some direction around what that might look like and how to do that. Um, so that really prompted what we sort of uh, call evidence-informed policy in the VA. Um, so for the first time, um, as part of its focus on suicide prevention, the VA sort of developed a standardized, evidence-based, informed strategy for enterprise-wide suicide screening and evaluation. So prior to this, we didn't even have a standardized way of screening in mental health settings, an inpatient mental health setting. So this really um, took that and standardized it really across the board. Um, across um, populations and across settings in the VA. Um, so this policy uh, went out in May for May of 2018 with a sort of implementation start date of October 2018. Uh, so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about <coughs> is looking at sort of the first year, uh, first year and a half of implementation of this national program. Um, I'm, we've kind of touched on this before um, a little bit already, but I think what's really uh, innovative about this is that it doesn't just focus on that indicated screening um, and that population who we know is already at an elevated risk. So people sort of coming to um, get inpatient psychiatric care or mental health residential care. Um, we kind of know that this uh, cohort of individuals is already at risk. This sort of moves beyond that and does sort of more selected and universal screening. Um, so selected individuals who have um, mental health diagnoses or behavioral health disorders. Um, those with medical conditions and diagnoses that may increase risk for suicide, such as chronic pain, sleep disorders, um, and then moving beyond individuals who, um, who don't have a diagnosis of a mental health or behavioral health condition, who are just coming in for a routine primary um, care appointment or are going to the ED for something that's not sort of mental health related. So really kind of looking at the population um, across the board and incorporating these sort of screening principles. Um, again, this just highlights some of the implementation settings. Um, we're kind of covering a lot of ground here. This isn't every setting in the VA, but I think it covers pretty much the vast majority, particularly primary care. So we have about 5.6 million veterans um, who seek primary care in the, in the VA out of like um, 7.8 million. Um, and some of those, um, some of the, the rest of those um, 
uh, veterans just seek um, outpatient mental health only. Um, so they're covered under, um, under this setting as well. So what does it consist of? It's basically a three-stage process. So we incorporated two levels of screening. So we do um, a primary screen, which is item nine from the PHQ-9, so the single item that <coughs> inquires about um, suicidal ideation. And the goal of that is really to, to increase sensitivity. We want to capture anyone who might be at risk, um, uh, sort of a larger umbrella. If they have a positive primary screen, we move on to a second level of screening. That's the Columbia screener. So uh, the Columbia screener asks specifically about suicidal ideation, intent, plan, and lifetime behavior. Um, it's really intended to identify sort of individuals who may sort of need more timely evaluation and intervention. So sort of, again, actionable risk. Um, and then the third stage, if they score positive on the Columbia, is a comprehensive suicide risk evaluation. Uh, that is a template that we created in the VA sort of based on recommendations on the CPG. Uh, it covers a lot of different sort of areas that we sort of know are critical for suicide risk assessment. And the goal of that is at the end to be able to stratify suicide risk, uh, both in terms of chronic risk and acute risk. So that sometimes is a concept that's sort of uh, newer to folks, so I brought some handouts on sort of what that looks like in terms of acute and chronic risk and um, how that sort of informs different risk mitigation <laughs> strategies. So feel free to just raise some of those. Yeah. Um, the, this is just the question on the I-9. Um, basically, any response except for not at all is considered a positive screen. Um, and then you go on to the Columbia. So what's cool about the Columbia screener is that it has branching logic built into it. Um, and we basically program, program that into our medical record. So um, if you ask questions one and two and those are no, you skip right to uh, question six. Um, if the, either of those are yes, then you can kind of go on with the rest of the questions. So at minimum, they're asking three questions and anywhere um, up to six uh, questions or eight if you count those some questions. Um, and then a positive score is basically a yes so on items three, four, five, or six to eight. So they've had to have an attempt in the last three months um, if they're no to everything else. Um, and the comprehensive suicide risk evaluation, again, it's uh, designed to be a more in-depth assessment of factors that can con contribute to suicide risk. Um, it's really meant to be therapeutic and collaborative. So we have like a template that's a guide, but it doesn't really say how to ask the questions. And we've actually gotten sort of mixed um, feedback about this. Some clinicians love it. They love that, oh, I just need to cover these areas, but I can kind of, you know, how I ask the questions is sort of up to me and it can be more conversational. We've had um, other providers who are like, I need a script. Um, and I think that just speaks to sort of the range of providers that are now doing this because we have taken it out of sort of mental health. Um, for the comprehensive, we don't require that it be a mental health provider as long as a, it's an LIP or licensed independent uh, practitioner um, can do it. So I think it's just really interesting to sort of see the range of feedback that we've gotten about this. Um, and like I said, the goal is to stratify um, sort of acute and chronic risk, and based on that stratification, you identify sort of tailored um, risk mitigation strategies um, for a veteran. Um, and here are the different sections that the, um, the CSRE covers. Um, ideation, attempts, warning signs, risk factors. Um, again, all of that really guides um, the clinical impressions of acute and chronic risk. This is also a smart form, so like as you answer each sort of question, depending on the response, it sort of opens up additional questions. So it can take anywhere from, you know, like probably five to like up the upwards of 15 or 20 minutes, depending on someone's history and depending on if you're doing kind of an initial evaluation versus just an update of that evaluation. This is, sorry, I don't know if I'm interrupting, just to clarify, so is that true for the earlier forms as well? Like if. If they answer the right way on the initial screen, it goes right to the more specific suicide risk screen, and then so it's all the way through embedded in the electronic health record. Yes, Great. so um, they're they're not in sort of one template together, but they're all sort of separate templates. And um, for for some settings like uh, primary care and ambulatory care, we built in sort of reminders. So if they do trigger, it does trigger a positive. They have a positive screen, it triggers. The mm -hmm. secondary screen that pops up for the provider. So some of this sort of decision support and some of the tools have been really critical to sure. implementation. Thanks. Um, so that's sort of the, the research and the policy. Now I'm going to sort of spend a little bit of time talking about sort of how we went from this policy to actual <laughs> practice and implementation. 
which is definitely um, a lot more um, more challenging, especially doing this sort of like nationally and enterprise wide. Um, so this is sort of the model that we use. I would really love to tell you that this was a priority. We looked at the literature and we're like, oh, this would be the best model for this, and we're just going to use this as our framework. This kind of just happened um, sort of naturally, I, I guess I would say, um, which is actually speaks to how practical this model is um, and intuitive in terms of sort of implementing something sort of um, in a healthcare system. So basically what um, sort of the EPSIS model is that there's really these key components to sort of ensuring sort of um, successful implementation and providing implementation support for evidence-based practices. Um, those are training, TA tools, and sort of ongoing quality um, improvement and quality assurance. Um, and what's really great is, you know, these things are sort of essential on their own, but they really, the, the synergy of them working together is really the ideal. So you're going to provide tools for people, but you're going to provide training on how to use those tools. Um, you're also going to be providing sort of ongoing technical, technical assistance, uh, especially during the beginning of sort of program implementation, because things are going to come up. Um, you can't anticipate all the things that actually come up when you're doing this in practice. Um, so you're going to want to be able to sort of uh, provide, anticipate that and provide sort of the ongoing sort of problem solving to the field. Um, so this is really kind of a, a nice, again, practical model for, um, for how we can um, do implementation on this larger scale. And we've actually applied this to um, other programs that we've implemented um, in the VA as well. Um, so in terms of tools, um, we've developed sort of a centralized SharePoint um, for this. So there, it's a one-stop shop. It's not located in a million different places. Everything related to this um, initiative and um, actually subsequent initiatives like safety planning and emergency room, which is sort of an add-on, we have in this one location. Can, can I ask a quick question? Sorry to interrupt. This, um, that SharePoint is for folks sort of within the, yes. once you've logged into the VA. Right. So like, Non not yet. Oh, not yet. Okay, yeah. But we are actually <laughs> developing a mirror um, website that oh, is going to be available to everyone cool. outside the VA. Because we, I, I think one thing in terms of dissemination that we realize is that this is can have obviously applicability to not just the VA healthcare system. So we really want to make um, all these resources and sort of these processes transparent for for people outside the VA and just. Hopefully, it'll be sort of helpful for, for those who are um, looking at sort of implementing something similar in their in their system of care. Can I ask a quick question just yeah. on that topic? Yeah. Um, the trainings that you mentioned, do you have training tools or training things that you developed that would also be available? So we have, um, so the trainings that we've developed, which, yeah, I'll, I'll get into the next. Okay. So what's actually great about that is um, most of them are right now in the TMS system, which is the VA system, but VA sort of has a sister uh, version of that called TRAIN. So a lot of the trainings that we create in TMS can then be also in TRAIN for community providers. That is also um, a, a plan to do. We have to revise some of the things because they're so VA specific. So we're going to kind of, kind of revise some of the sort of language around um, the trainings for the community providers. But yes, that is also... Um, on the docket um, to do, so it will be available to, to outside providers. Um, so besides the SharePoint, we have um, FAQs. Oh my gosh, this is this started out as like a three-page document. I don't know, it's probably like 30 pages right now. Um, but it is all That's themed, cute. and there's a like table of contents, and it goes through different issues per settings, and everything you can imagine. And um, we, we found that Putting this together has helped. It's, it's interesting because people are at different stages of adoption, right? So you think that you've addressed one issue, and then like six months later, you get a flurry of sort of the same questions and same issues coming up again. And it's so nice because you can just refer back to this document and um, give a really consistent response to those. Um, it is because it's just it doesn't it happens in a there's an ebb and flow, and there's a, a different facilities are adopting this at different rates. So I think just being kind of mindful of that and prepared. Um, has been really helpful. Um, we have printable screeners. So one thing that came up in the field is I don't have a computer when I'm meeting bedside with a patient. I need to be able to have you know these on hand um, without accessing the computer or um, providers who go to do home-based primary care and they're in, in the veteran's home. They also don't always have access to a computer. So we created these printable versions of it. 
Um, like I mentioned before, folks had different reactions to the to the CSRE being sort of less structured or, or guided, um, and they wanted a script. They wanted like, how do I ask these questions? Um, how do I ask someone whether they're having suicidal thoughts and the follow up questions? So we provided some um, additional um, guidance and questions for folks who wanted that um, uh, that level of structure. Uh, we also um, had a lot of input from the field um, in terms of what was working for them and tools they created. Um, we had one nurse um, create, um, you know, the, your badges. There's a laminate, <coughs> a square rectangle version um, laminate that you can just stick on your badge that has all the screening questions on it. And that came really handy, like when um, they were in the ED or for inpatient uh, med surge. Um, it was great. So we basically took that idea and we just mass produced it. Um, it was, it's been very helpful and, and popular for the field. Uh, workflow mapping was another like um, big one. Um, so how does this actually work in, in the ED and urgent care? How does it work if you're at a sort of level, a more um, complex facility versus sort of a smaller um, level three facility? So we had a lot of um, input from the field and they put these great resources together and then we share them with the field. You know, super, um, super grateful and appreciative when someone sort of thought through all of these um, kind of processes and issues that they're facing. Can I ask a question about that? Yeah. Was the in terms of who's doing the screening, was that defined at a systems level, or was that up to each unit to determine that? Both. Like, okay. So we had some general requirements for who could do the primary, um, secondary, and comprehensive, just based on sort of discipline and scope of practice. Mm -hmm. Um, and within that, um, it just depended on the setting and the workflow they developed. So we left that flexible. So we had, for instance, in primary care, this was something that came up. Um, the, the second level screening was part of a reminder that had a disposition in it. So RNs could actually do that because they can't, with, it's not within their scope of practice to do disposition. Mm -hmm. um, but what they could do is they could open up just the CSSRS and sort of the mental health assistant and then do that without the disposition component on it and then do sort of a warm handoff uh, to the LIP if it was positive for the for the CSRE. So people came up with their own you know processes and we wanted it to be sort of flexible in that way because every you know every facility is different. Um, there's just different sort of constraints and um, staffing levels and you know other competing sort of demands. So we did want it to be flexible in that sense. That's a great question. Are there self-administered versions of the screening in there? Not yet. Oh, okay. You know, I mean, that's another thing yeah. <laughs> um, that we have been really trying to push and push and push. It's so interesting in the VA. It's like the yeah, opposite. You guys are probably yeah. self so <laughs> Do we have like a my help sort of harassment tool? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have that. Yeah. Like we have, um, and there is some some things that are being done over uh, my healthy bed. Uh, but what I mean, we have key houses, we have iPads. We're, we're trying to get them at least, you know, can they do this while they're, you know, waiting for their appointment? Mm -hmm. um, can you know, there be some level of kind of then, you know, the primary care provider or the, you know, nurse care manager being able to look at this and then sort of prompt and stage the conversation they're going to have, and, and especially if they have to go on to the CSRE. We're just, it's just a lot of regulatory and IT kind of issues that we're trying to get through mm -hmm. the VA to do this. Um, but it is, we're, that is definitely something that we're, and I, I think probably what we're going to have to do is kind of more pilot that as research um, before we sort of rule it out. Um, practice, but it's a great question as well. And I'm sorry if I missed this one more question. Um, is it every encounter? Is it once a year? Like, what's the frequency that you're asking? Awesome question. <laughs> Depends on the setting. Um, okay. ED is every count encounter. Okay. So every time a veteran comes in, regardless of the reason, they get screened. Uh, primary care, right now what we've done is we focus on the cohort of patients who are eligible for annual depression and PTSD screening, so they don't already have a diagnosis. Um, so those who are already getting care for depression um, um, or another mental health or behavioral health concern in primary care, that's sort of up to the provider to do sort of at intake or as needed. Um, and mental health outpatients always at intake and is clinically indicated. Um, and then I guess annually for those individuals in, in primary care who don't have a diagnosis already. So yeah, it, 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 it depends. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I think you know part of what we're also trying to figure out um, moving forward is sort of what what should sort of the guidelines for re-screen 
be mm -hmm. um, and sort of how are we going to go about sort of figuring that out mm -hmm. across settings. Um, our training was really, um, we did a <coughs> number of webinars and um, trainings for just the overall strategy. Again, these are recorded. We had live um, sessions and they were recorded uh, for folks to access later on. Um, we did one specific to sort of the screening tools themselves, um, sort of more in-depth and also um, specific to the CSRE. Uh, one thing that uh, came up sort of later on was, I just don't know how you're supposed to sit there with the patient and fill out the um, CSRE, but sort of maintain rapport and not be looking at your computer the whole time. And um, so we did a more advanced training um, on how you do that. Like we actually had our you know practitioner in front of the computer like she would and just demonstrated how you don't always have to be kind of entering everything at the computer at the same time. You can have pauses and breaks and sort of, um, you know, make this a, a more patient-centered collaborative process. Um, and, and we had a lot of providers just, uh, they found that to be incredibly um, useful and beneficial. Um, I think part of what came up through this, and we're actually um, partnering with the National Ed Education Employee System and the VA to do more soft skills training. So how do you sit in a room with a, a patient who might be at risk and have this conversation? How do you develop a level of comfort around that um, and ask these what can be sort of difficult questions for providers to ask, especially if they're not sort of traditionally sort of mental health or behavioral trained? Um, again, because we're expanding this to a, a much broader range of providers and kind of having sort of more of those soft skills development um, skills is going to be really important. And, that was a request that we've gotten from the field um, that we're you know, um, trying to you know, follow through with. Um, technical assistant, um, again, the idea behind this, particularly in the beginning of implementation, is that you're giving some sort of um, ongoing assistance, helping folks troubleshoot, um, creating a forum. Um, ours is weekly, weekly calls on Thursdays um, around noon. Um, we have um, a number of different um, providers um, attend. So as part of implementation, what we required was that each facility identify a facility champion. And there are, the role of the facility champion wasn't necessarily, you have to make sure implementation is happening. It's how do you sort of keep up with um, sort of um, changes to the program? How do you communicate that to the field? Do you How do you train some of your uh, providers and, and how to do this? And we provided a lot of the trainings and resources for them that they could use so they didn't have to create this from scratch. But they're sort of our, our main kind of internal champion slash conduit to the field. Um, and they have uh, been just invaluable in implementing this. The things that they have sort of brought back to us that we then had to troubleshoot um, and refine in terms of implementation have been really, um, really critical. Um, so they're the main people that are on those uh, weekly calls, but we have leadership, we have facility leadership, we have folks from all kinds of, uh, all sectors, not just sort of mental health or suicide prevention coordinators, we have folks from ED, um, we have quality managers, which is awesome to see um, our quality managers sort of um, on these calls. Um, and then we have sort of an email support. So we've had this since the inception of the program. So, um, we, we have a staff who monitors this in response to questions. And of course, when we started, we had a lot more volume. And that's really decreased over time, um, which, is, which is nice um, <laughs> uh, to see. And uh, I think, again, we get sort of some of these repeat questions every now and then. But... Um, it it kind of gives us a little bit of a litmus test um, to see sort of how the field is doing and sort of who are kind of our champions in terms of adoption and who are kind of um, maybe our facilities that are, are struggling a little bit more to, to get this in place. Um, and we have on average about 171 um, folks attend the weekly TA calls still. Um, and what's really cool is that we theme, theme them now. So we have themes that come up through the emails. We're like, okay, we could do a whole session, TA session on this. So um, we, for any new materials that we develop um, to sort of troubleshoot or address issues in the field, we sort of pr present those resources and um, it's sort of an ongoing chat. So we're answering questions in the chat and sort of having sort of more of a live discussion. Um, it's also kind of, this is evolved into, it's just a community of practice. 
I don't have to answer the questions anymore. Actually, the, the people on the you know call are answering it for each other. They actually beat me to it. Um, so I think it's just, again, it's been really nice to see sort of how this has evolved over, over time. Um, in terms of quality insurance and improvement, we've developed, um, so here's just kind of a screenshot of the no template for the CSRA, but what we've done is um, it's a template that providers go through, but we have sort of tips embedded in it. So sort of what's the definition when you're asking about suicidal intent, how do we define suicidal intent? Um, what, um, what are sort of some of the criteria for um, a high level of acute risk versus an intermediate level of acute risk? So we have these sort of embedded tips throughout um, that providers who are familiar with it, they don't have to like look it up, um, but they can if, if they need sort of some of that um, further, further guidance. Uh, we also have um, sort of direct links to making consults and the risk mitigation strategies of placing a consult. Um, for instance, a local, like a consult to the suicide risk management um, team is um, one of the strategies you want to pick. We have a, a link that directly takes them to that and places the consult. So really trying to streamline things and make it more efficient for providers who are doing this. Um, we also developed a follow-up report. I kind of just X'd out uh, patient identification, uh, identifying information right here. Um, but this is updated daily. Um, so if I'm in a clinic and I want to go see, uh, I want to make sure that um, any of my patients who've had a positive I-9, make sure they got a same day um, CSSRS, and those who had a positive Columbia got a same day CSRE, I can go do that. Um, so this really helps me sort of monitor and just more ongoing quality improvement. Um, what you kind of like, on, on this screenshot, what we notice and what what is happening most of the time, it's not that it's not being done, it's not being done timely. So a lot of times folks leave the clinic and then they're called later um, to do the second level screening with the CSRE, so that's something that we're really trying to work on in terms of um, implementation and what's, what's, ha what's happening workflow-wise where um, it's not sort of being done sort of in a timely um, manner. Let me ask, I was curious, I had heard that the DOD military and VA are gonna Join in a great center. Is that what you guys are already on, or are you going to redo all of this? We're going to have to redo some of this. Okay. So what what we're trying to do too is we're trying to um, right now we have a lot of things are piecemeal. So we have this for ambulatory care. We only have like another dashboard for emergency. We don't have anything for outpatient mental health or inpatient med surge. So what we're really trying to work on is kind of coming up with an integrated dashboard that can sort of also live outside of Cerner. Um, and that will, again, prevent providers from having to look up 50 million different like links and dashboards, and it's all kind of right there. <coughs> um, and it's both patient level and facility aggregate level. Because that's, that's the other thing, we either have it kind of either or, um, either you kind of open something up and it's all patient level, but you're not really kind of, you don't have sort of a summary of sort of how you're doing as a facility or in different settings with the facility. Um, so that's kind of the, the next sort of round or um, iteration of some of the dashboard tools we're, we're trying to create. Um, and we also develop pilot performance metrics so that we can sort of evaluate sort of uptake across, um, across facilities. So those are sort of the four components. I think another big piece of this is the relationships or what we kind of refer to as the outer context. Um, there are a lot of different folks involved in implementing this um, from sort of, uh, you know, bottom, bottom up, top down, however you want to kind of look at it. Communication between each of these has been essential. Um, the, the implementation team is sort of a middle ground between the program office and sort of frontline providers and staff. So it's not, we're kind of seen as a little bit of a buffer. We're seen as really kind of supporting them and not like, are you doing this correctly? Are you doing this wrong? So um, not sort of as punitive and really helping them troubleshoot. Um, where you know, clearly um, our job is to be available uh, to the field um, and address things as they come up in, in real time. Um, we report that back to policy makers and um, the program office and we make decisions together. Um, do we need to give this more time to actually collect more data? Does this need to be changed now? How, you know, how are we gonna go about doing that process? Um, and then I think regional and facility leadership and just communication um, with them around sort of why we're doing this and sort of where we're at and um, taking their feedback um, as we continue to implement this has really been key um, and just achieve, achieving buy-in um, 
um, for this whole process. So I think this is just to show that you know communication, um, ongoing communication across levels, between levels, has been really critical um, to the success of this. And I think it, you know, part of what we're trying to do is change the culture around suicide prevention and screening. And it's kind of everybody's business and everybody's responsibility. Um, so I think part of like creating that um, culture is actually really making everyone's input, you know, part of this process and um, allowing them to have feedback and, and, and actually sort of um, not honor that feedback, but also um, follow through with, with some of the changes that need to be made. Um, that I think that totally leads to this idea of like, we're not doing this to you, but we're doing with this uh, sort of with you. Um, and we truly are sort of a learning healthcare system that's constantly evolving um, as this continues. Um, all right, so I might just pause there for a second. I know there's like a lot in terms of implementation. So before I go into sort of some of the data and findings and the, <coughs> any questions or, yeah, like 20 questions. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to like just answer one. Okay. Right. So where does at all safety planning fit in? It's a great question. So safety planning um, as part of risk ID is part of the risk mitigation strategy checklist. So when they do the CSRE, okay. that is one of the interventions they can select. It is gotcha. not required except for ED now. Um, okay. I didn't go into SPED a whole lot, um, which is safety planning in the ED. That's an initiative that was built on top of this initiative. Um, so in the ED, um, if uh, someone gets a CSRE, um, and they're uh, discharged to home, but they're at either high or an intermediate acute or chronic risk, they have to get a safety plan before they leave. Um, so that's sort of where safety planning comes in for that specific population. That's the only population right now of cohort that it's required for. Um, it's just kind of up to, you know, obviously the clinician's judgment whether that's a risk mitigation strategy that they want to um, implement depending on the, the level of risk determined by the CSRE. Um, if somebody screens positive mm -hmm. and you go through this process and they're not at acute high risk, yes. but they're still at risk, yes. do you have a follow-up in place to see kind of the resources that you, you know, provided them to see if it actually, if they follow through with it or not? So, well, that is part of the, the risk mitigation strategy selection. Um, so, like a follow-up or a timely follow-up. We, again, we haven't we haven't dictated specific requirements around that. So what we're hoping to do, um, sort of next, and this kind of goes into the research and evaluation piece, and sort of how that sort of informs practice. We have a lot of CSREs right now, um, just based on the first year of implementation. What we kind of want to do is go and look and see what what risk mitigation strategies in, um, providers are selecting based on the risk level, and then if that's sort of affecting sort of patient outcomes long run. So that the whole point of having the CSRE is, right, that you're differentiating level of risk and then you have tailored strategies for different risk levels. If we show that it doesn't really matter what level of risk is, everyone's getting the same intervention, that will be interesting and I think raises some questions about sort of potentially the benefits of stratifying risk, which I think there is some, you know, question about in the field. Um, so I think that is definitely, again, one of those sort of follow-up um, items that we're going to be looking at. Um, we got a query grant to actually do sort of more of an adaptive implementation strategy and one of the things we're looking at is does level, level of risk actually, um, or where people um, end up in the process, whether they just get the screening or whether they actually get the full CSRE, does that impact whether they get set safety planning and other more tailored um, interventions. From the Columbia, yes. or do they have to get to the CSRE? Uh, yes, to items three, four, or five. So, so planner, planner, plan, intent. plan, intent, or behavior in the last or, three months. Okay, so they're like lifetime behavior only. No, no. Okay. Okay. okay, so I'm going to talk mainly about sort of our findings in ambulatory care and emergency department because those are our two biggest sort of areas in terms of implementation. Um, so this is uh, findings for FY19, so basically this is um, October 1st of 2018 to September 30th of 2019, so that's how the year works. Um, so we had over 4 million veterans who were eligible to receive the primary screen. How, what percentage do you think about it? 20. Oh, man. 
So they were already kind of used to getting these depression and PTSD screeners. We just tacked the I-9 um, into the tool and the reminders that they were um, already, you know, doing pretty good at in terms of implementation. Um, so from there, we had um, uh, over 4, mil 4 million people who got the I-9 as the band part of depression or PTSD screening. So these are individuals who don't have a mental health diagnosis. Um, we had 3.6% uh, positive I-9 which is kind of what we expected. Um, similar to some of the findings um, in Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas, they did um, a universal um, screening um, program. They, they used the Columbia to start out with, but 3.6 positive I-9. Of those, 70% <coughs> got the second level screen, so CSRE. So we could definitely do, be doing a little better in, in ensuring that folks who have a positive primary screen are actually getting um, the secondary screen. And that's sort of on the same day again, so the whole timeliness piece of it is important. Mm -hmm. um, and of those who got the Columbia or the second level screen, 20% um, of those with a positive ion also had a positive Columbia. Uh, so when you look at sort of the whole uh, cohort, so this is everyone who's eligible, these are kind of our rates. So 3.4% positive I-9 and 0.5% um, positive same day CSSRS. So I mean, we're, we're talking about like a a small but sizable, you know, number of individuals who probably normally wouldn't, their risk for suicide would not be recognized because they're not getting through these measures um, on, on a routine basis. How and many this, got the next, not same day, but eventually sort of thing? The CSRE. Yeah. Program, oh, okay. uh, about half. Okay. Um, so eventually got it. Eventually. So you have really high rates. Yeah. That's really so high. Do you, have, do you have a sense, ballpark, the number who had a pre existing mental health? But presumably are being screened in other mechanisms. Yeah, so those folks are going to be a higher rate. Right. So this is about um, our the sort of eligible population for the mental health screening plus the suicide screening is about two thirds of the veteran population. So we have another third of the veteran population that would hopefully have been screened during uh, mental health intake appointments, um, or we have a whole inpatient cohort. So inpatient be screened upon, admission, discharge, um, both um, psychiatric and medical. We don't have, I guess we don't have the exact number, but we, this covers about two-thirds of the BHA seeking population. Um, so ED works a little differently because it's encounter-based versus individual-based. Um, so in um, FY19, we had um, over almost two and a half million unique encounters they could have been screened. What what do you think the percentage is for this? Eighty. <laughs> <laughs> um, a little uh, lower in ED. Um, this was in part because what we did in the ED was really cool. So if you look at this per quarter, it actually increases pretty significantly. We developed a national ED triage template that had the I nine embedded in it. Before that, it was kind of just whatever. Um, so. It, I think just the rate of adoption was, you know, slower for, for folks that where it took a, a while for them to get the, the national template embedded in their system and actually start using it. But once we had most of the facilities on board, the, these numbers went up. Um, and it's fair to say some of these encounters probably are, can't talk. At the t I mean, yeah, I think critical I, care. Oh, let me go back. So, I think oh, it was 0.5%. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, so not, you know, but we do now, but, uh, but yeah, some, for sure. Um, so over the one, or like 1 1.9 people who got the I-9 during the visit, we had um, 2.6 positive, uh, 3.6 in um, ambulatory care, uh, 82, so higher number of people actually getting the CSSRS, which is, which is neat to see. Um, we have a, a, a different kind of, um, benchmark for ED and that has to be within 24 hours just because it's just more practical and feasible the way the ED works. So uh, versus the same day, just more time. Yeah. Because they're sitting around. Right. 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 And then you're like, what, what if it's someone comes in at 11 o'clock and then it's, you know, they don't get the secondary screen until like 1 a.m. You know, it's, it's 
<laughs> all these crazy, you know, machinations of what can happen. Um, and then, okay, this is really interesting. So 66%, over two-thirds of people who got the primary, had a positive primary screen and also had a positive chlamydia. So this was about one-fifth in ambulatory care. So really interesting. Three or higher on the chlamydia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think this kind of just speaks to the you know more acute nature of people presenting sort of to the to the ED with, with suicide risk. So I think you have a cohort of veterans who are just know across the board, but if they are presenting because of a mental health or behavioral concern or in distress, I think they're just going to be more more acute. Um, and so folks who were engaged in mental health outpatient care but had an ED visit would have been screened. Yes. Right. So the ones yes. who they might not have been screened in an ambulatory setting. Right. Anyone who comes to the area screen, so that also exactly. could bump it. Right. Yes, and right now we're actually looking at um, overlap of that population. So how many people like um, got screened in primary care as well as sort of ED um, the same year? What do those responses look like? Is there something about the ED set setting that might likely contribute to sort of a um, higher rate of like having a positive screen? So we're looking at some of that right now. Um, so this is sort of what the overall prevalence looks like if you look at sort of all the whole number of encounters that were eligible for screening. Um, so a, a little lower um, in terms of the I-9, but higher in terms of the Columbia. And, and how do you explain that, the, the lower initial screen compared um, to ambulatory? I mean, I, I just, I think that you're basically going to have um, a, a population that's um, either somewhat bifurcated, so either they're not at risk at all, um, or they're lower percentage, sort of maybe overall that's at risk, but they're at a higher level of risk. Mm -hmm. um, or they may not, some, I don't know, I don't know, some people may not disclose low levels of risk, and yeah. they are, but they went to their primary care provider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you might you might mention this later, but I'm just curious. Um, do you have any concerns about accuracy in the data? Um, like, would there be any reason for somebody to lie? Are there any negative consequences that can come from opening up about this this thing that you're experiencing? And then, kind of a follow up question: Like, how um, important? You're talking about the soft skills training. How important do you think that like trust and rapport piece is to to um, elicit like accurate responses? Yeah. I think that's that's critical. Um, what we haven't done, we um, I'm part of a team that got a, a grant to actually look at the patient perspective of this. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be interviewing patients who've gone through the screening at right. uh, and different levels of the screening in the different settings, and basically ask them what. Because one thing we're also concerned with is, given sort of some of the overlap in this population, is like over screening mm -hmm. and like burnout. Um, these questions and sort of kind of that working against us in some way, like you're just kind of, you know, don't want to answer. But we've also had some really great positive sort of anecdotal stories of like, this one um, general veteran said that he's been seeing his primary care physician for 20 years, mm -hmm. and this is the first time someone has asked about that and they took the time to talk to them about that. So it's kind of this thing, it's like if you don't ask, you don't always know, you don't know. Uh, but then sort of what's the balance of just asking too much or, you know, um, um, I think those are all th things that we are, you know, part of what we're trying to figure out too. And I think the evaluation piece is really critical to that ongoing evaluation. Um, so one thing about the CSRE that's kind of neat is that it wasn't required in FY19. This wasn't required actually until October of this year. It was available for... Um, sites to use. Um, they had to do some sort of a risk assessment if they were positive on the Columbia, but they didn't have to do um, the CSRE. That's because we went through a couple like um, cycles of refining that um, that template. Um, but even though it wasn't required, I mean, we got about 50% <coughs> who were giving the CSRE um, after positive CSSRS um, in both ambulatory care and, and ED. So that was, we were actually really surprised to, to see that. Um, so just, I think overall, um, it's, it's feasible. <laughs> feasible in ambulatory care and ED. Um, we were actually surprised to see the numbers sort of as high as they were. Um, I think trends just increasing across each quarter um, as we uh, implementation sort of continued. Um, small percentage of those screening positive on the primary screen. 
Um, and almost half of those who um, screened positive on the Columbia were actually getting the CSRE, even though it wasn't required um, during that year. Um, interesting things when you compare the settings, uh, I think one of the most um, interesting findings is that uh, positive I-9, of those with a positive I-9 who um, received a Columbia, uh, about one-fifth of them were, um, Columbias were positive and ambulatory care compared to like two-thirds. So that's um, really interesting when you think about um, the, maybe the I-9 not adding that much to ED, um, we might be sort of better off just kind of um, starting with the Columbia. And um, this data, I think, in combination with some joint commission changes and concerns, um, really kind of helped us kind of change things in the ED. So we were getting a lot of citations um, in ED and urgent care um, because the joint commission doesn't consider the I-9 as a validated tool. Um, and they recently changed their sort of uh, screening criteria uh, for their um, National Patient Safety Goal 15 in July of 2019 which is after we implemented this. Um, and they're like, it's a single item. If you give the whole PHQ-9, that's fine. The I-9 by itself is not validated. So we are in continued discussions with them. Um, but really what we kind of were left with is a couple different choices. We could uh, continue to get the I-9 to folks in the ED and risk getting more cited more. Um, we could... Um, do sort of a two-tiered system where if someone's coming to the ED and they are presenting with a mental health or behavioral concern, we would jump to the Columbia and skip the I-9. For the others, we would just skip the I-9, but we were just really concerned that would be just way too complicated to come up with that sort of a two-tiered system and just sort of really confusing for providers. Um, or the, sure the third option was really just let's get rid of the I-9 and start with the Columbia um, for everyone. So. We basically went from a three-stage process to a two-stage process in the ED. Um, How much time does the just secondary screen take? So it's anywhere from three to six questions. So at minimum, it's three questions. So it could take a couple of minutes if you're no, no, no on everything. Um, a little longer if it's you're actually having to go through each of the, the questions. I point out, yeah. our, it's been, you maybe say what our ED is doing now, but I remember her nurse manager pointed out if you counted up all of the nurse screening questions, there were like 27 different questions that included all the drop downs. And so three questions sounds like nothing, but then mm -hmm. right, falls in alcohol and marijuana yep. and all these yep. other things. And, yep. um, it, this, and this is why you then get to rates that are either you get low rates of actually doing it, or they start, understandably, lumping questions into like you don't drink. Or have thoughts of hurting yourself rather than the night. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, yeah. Oh, no, 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 please. Um, so I, in Kaiser, we're having it, like similar sorts of numbers in that we have good screening rates for PHQ 9, good follow up rates on the Columbia, and then yeah. that next step <laughs> where yes. things start to like go south yes. a little bit. Um, and so one of the things they're considering now is. Because we actually have about 20% of the score three or higher too on the CSSRS okay. in the okay. ambulatory care setting uh -huh. um, after they do I-9. And it, what they want to do is safety funding with all of those, which is not feasible because it's resource too resource intensive. Yeah. And so now they're looking at splitting the threes okay. and just doing it for those that have plan yes. or recent behavior. And then for those that have like lifetime, they get the three because they have yeah. lifetime and yes. incurred ideation, just do like a lethal means assessment sort of very short. Um, version like step six of the safety plan yes. only yes. Um, and so yeah they haven't implemented that that's sort of what's on the table right now yeah. Yeah. so I think what what we are discovering and what we would like to do is like look at sort of with some of the data we've collected as far as we can sort of um, uh, potentially have different cutoff options so right if, if like for instance they have not said that they don't have um, like a plan or intent or they haven't engaged in the last three months that just be a behavioral health consult and they get the CSRE or the yeah. death evaluation at some point, but not it doesn't have to be right then and there that same day. So absolutely I think it's some of the criteria right now is super like conservative and I think we need to be looking at kind of potentially adapting that based on some of the data that we have to help inform that. But and Columbia hasn't been really looked at in the veteran population on this scale in terms of the 
you know, screen or two, so which is another, you know, issue in and of itself. But um, yeah, I think so many different opportunities to. to Who gets the legal means? Any legal means sort of section or intervention? We address legal means as part of the CSRB. Okay, so it's not they have to get to that far. Yes, exactly. Oh okay. yeah. Um, so I think just in terms of sort of next steps, sort of continuing with this ongoing cycle of sort of research evaluation and policy and practice, we, we got some funding from Query to do, um, to build an adaptive implementation strategy. So we're doing sort of a smart trial where um, based on facilities performance, we give them sort of a step in implementation strategy. So we're not starting everyone with this like really high dose of doing external facilitation and going to sites and doing ongoing coaching. We're, we're going to see who does well with implementation as usual, um, and then folks who are still having trouble kind of meeting the benchmark um, after sort of six or seven months um, will receive sort of the next level, which is the audit and feedback um, intervention that's sort of tailored to their facility. Um, we're, we're hoping that will help um, most sites who are really kind of probably on the, the cusp of, of getting there, um, but we know that some sites are probably going to need that um, extra level of intervention and support. Uh, which, would be, which would be facilitation, so really going in and doing some more um, active problem solving with sites and ongoing consultation. Um, so that's sort of the, the next step. Um, I, I do sort of want to highlight just in terms of like my resources and, and programs that we have available to sort of the community and um, we would love to see just more, um, more folks sort of at the university and community utilizing these, these resources we have. Um, a national suicide risk management consultation service for providers, any provider serving a veteran. If you've ever seen a veteran um, and you think you know that they might be at risk, um, there's a, a number of different um, services we offer. Um, you get one-on-one -on -one consultation with sort of expert um, consultants um, who are um, trained and do this sort of day-to-day. -day. Um, these are just some of the areas that you can get consultation on. Um, and additional resources on. Um, we have a website that really just takes you through um, the process of sort of, you know, what this is, what you might use it for, how do you um, place a consult, um, what sort of happens when you place a consult and the whole process. And so really um, hoping, you know, to, to see more um, folks in sort of the community and diversity use this as a resource. Um, I have some cards there um, as well. Um, that tool sort of that we developed, um, which is sort of the risk management stratification tool. There is a whole sort of um, uh, course and sequence around sort of that process in and of itself. It could be a two or three hour um, workshop in and of itself, but we, we often consult about sort of just helping providers think about risk stratification, just not sort of at one point in time, but kind of what does it look like sort of more acutely and more chronically. Um, we also have a lot of different education project um, <laughs> products. So if you go to our website, we have um, a number of different resources that we'd be happy to sort of ship to you free. Um, and just uh, a lot of whole sort of section on legal means uh, safety and legal means safety training for providers. Um, we also would, I think, love to find just different opportunities to, to collaborate. We, We've had sort of a history of working really um, well with um, this department and a, a number of our sort of um, staff right now came from this program. So I uh, would love uh, yes. to see, um, you know, uh, more of that. And if you're interested, in, if any of this interests you and any of kind that of making a sort of systemic sort of a national sort of rollout of something sort of this size or just even something kind of, you know, on a more smaller scale, just please reach out. There's always, I feel like, opportunities um, to do sort of, kind of practicums or internships, and we, yeah, we love to talk more and collaborate more. Thank you. Great. Yeah, let's <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.